good afternoon it's monday the 8th of june 2020 just after one o'clock welcome to uk column news your host today mike robinson myself brian gerrish and uh, we're delighted to be joined by david scott bringing us northern exposure from north of the border well we're still locked down uh, well we are we are but the question is are we because of course uh, there have been lots of uh, protests going on over the last few days which don't seem to be paying too much attention to lockdown at all, or at least not social distancing. But uh, David, let's start with this. Breibart here pushing out this headline, protester tries to burn cenotaph flags at BLM London demo. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, Nigel Farage uh, pushing this out as well. Uh, can uh, at Pretty Patel tell us if this man will be charged? So uh, stills from a photograph, uh, sorry, sorry, stills from a video rather, uh, and uh, well, that video can be seen on various uh, mainstream media uh, reports if you want to see it. And the young man does appear to be trying to uh, set fire to the flag. Uh, and uh, well, people from the crowd immediately try to step in and stop him from doing that. They pull the flag away from him. They try to grab his ankles to get him down off the uh, off the cenotaph. Uh, but David, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first first thought is that that's. Uh, uh, judged to inflame opinion that's judged to provoke a response that's judged to in insult the nation provoke the nation and stir up the opposition of everything they hate which is the um right thinking traditional uh british approach to the world and they're trying to stir it up um i suspect to create violence i think what that's meant to do is create violence on the streets a violent backlash. Um, well, I think I think that's right, David. Now, uh, you have heard through your channels and we have heard through our channels uh, that there is an effort to uh, get people down to London this weekend or during this week uh, to try to protect the monuments, as it were. Uh, and this includes veterans groups, possibly uh, uh, people related to Tommy Robinson as well. Um, and if that's true, and it, it certainly seems to be, but uh, actually we'd, we'd like to ask anybody that has information about this to let us to give us a bit more on it. But if that's true, then that, that's potentially a pretty serious development. It is. I mean, the, the argument goes this, uh, the, the, the police have failed in their duty. Uh, the police have lost control of the streets. And then there's groups saying, well, it's now up to us to police the streets to protect our heritage. And you can see how the argument goes. Uh, but of course, it is the responsibility of Cressida Dick and the Metropolitan Police to police. And uh, I, I, I strongly suspect that the, the last thing that people who actually love this country should be doing is letting the authorities off the hook for their dereliction of duty by going down and making themselves a target for media slurs and violence uh, which will detract from the failure of the authorities to maintain even even basic law and order on the streets, let alone COVID-19 standards of uh, law and order on the streets. Yeah, we'll be coming on to, to that a bit more in the future. Any thoughts just before we move on? Well, my, my personal opinion um, has never changed, uh, Mike, and that this is yet further provo provo provocation. Sorry, got it out there in order to create violence because um, if violence can be created on the streets then everything becomes very easy for our government of opera of occupation we can bring in everything from complete lockdown to curfews so anybody at the moment who is actually pushing violence on the street is helping um, this draconian government system but we'll come on to more of that a little bit later Yes. Uh, now, this is Stephen Lovegrove, who's the permanent secretary to the Ministry of Defence, and he pushed out an email uh, this morning to everybody uh, serving in the military, uh, um, amongst others. Uh, and thanks very much for the person who sent this to us. Uh, and he's saying, uh, talking about uh, the issue of black and ethnic minorities uh, in the uh, military, he said, we briefly touched on the uh, topic of discrimination in our all staff dial in, and we want to take a moment to continue this, this vital conversation around race and inequality and what it means for us as individuals for defense uh, and for the world around us and he said the tragic death of george floyd in the usa last week has had a profound impact on many of us systemic racial inequality is not unique to america but also it has deep roots within uk society 
including defence. At the same time, ongoing research in COVID-19 increasingly shows that its deadly impact is felt harder in black and ethnic minority communities. Uh, he said that although we've seen a small increase of BAME representation in our uh, staff from 2019, our workforce doesn't yet represent the society we serve within the armed forces or the civil service. This is something we're determined to change. And he said uh, this message will be followed by more articles and blogs in the coming weeks, including support for BAME colleagues, educational tools and uh, opportunities to amplify the BAME voice within our organisation. Uh, many of you will know that Shirin, uh, Amin, I'm not even going to pronounce her surname, I do apologise to Shirin for this, but uh, I can't pronounce her surname, is our new race champion at the Ministry of Defence. And we're confident that her, uh, that her priorities, along with other champions, uh, will bring strength and action to this crucial dialogue. Now, what interested me about this, uh, David, a number of things, but first of all, let's just look at uh, Shirin. Uh, herself. She is Director of Infrastructure at the UK Ministry of Defence uh, and her previous CV shows that she was being trustee at the uh, Design Council, Head of Offices at Lend Lease Europe, uh, Chief Executive and Chief Operating Officer at Government Property Unit, uh, Vice President at Hawk and an Urban Designer at Terry Farrell. So my question, uh, David, is uh, what does she know about the issues of black and ethnic minorities and uh, and but to, the theme of the, the email uh, seemed to be about uh, the Ministry of Defence moving towards a stance of positive discrimination. Now, I can tell you from Northern Ireland that positive discrimination never works. What it does, in fact, is create further division uh, because uh, people that are, are in jobs that are qualified for jobs get stepped over uh, in, in order to make sure that the, the token uh, black and ethnic minority individual is put in a job. And that I'm, I can tell you for a fact that this does not work. So, so David, uh, this is deeply concerning to me because if we're seeing uh, the veterans community uh, being stoked up for something, um, we're seeing the same type of thing within the serving military community as well. Indeed. The, the, the idea that the Ministry of Defence, which is meant to be about defence, defence of the realm, is now saying, well, our, our biggest problem is racism. And uh, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to become racist. We're going to have racist hiring practices because that'll fix things. It's, it, I mean, is it lunacy? Is it evil? Is it, which, how do we get to such a lack of any sort of positive thinking about one another as human beings? How do we get to a point where that is the best that we can actually offer our nation? That level of analysis. It's, it's quite stunning. Yeah, D David, it's stunning, but we need to bring our minds back to the sort of 1985 period when the political charity Common Purpose got going because it was Common Purpose that was getting into everywhere from the schools, colleges, the NHS, the police and the military. And what, are they, what were they pushing at that stage? They were pushing diversity training. This was the start of messing around with people's minds to make them believe that uh, they were full of prejudices. And unless Common Purpose helped them get rid of those prejudices, people couldn't get on together. When in fact, what, what they were doing, what they were achieving is breaking up the relationship between people. And we had several cases where um, partners of police men and women were telling us how they had seen their police partners change as a result of common purpose training and that was a change for the worse the comment was we never had any racial discrimination within our police station within our particular force group we then did that common purpose diversity training and suddenly the seeds of doubt were there so this is deliberate policy and we're now starting to see it uh, it it increase in intensity to to cause this chaos it's deliberate david no question of it uh, well david uh, on friday we were uh, talking about the the number of police uh, and also fire services in the uk uh, having staged photographs of them bending the knee uh, and now we have this going on in scotland as well yes here we see uh a, a senior officer from Ayrshire leading two colleagues and uh, he's what you would call BAME 
um, and uh, the colleagues are both uh, a man and a woman and uh, suitably diverse and it's all very beautifully staged and here he is kneeling so what's he kneeling for it seems a very strange thing to be doing our police officers who are meant to be protecting us are outside kneeling on behalf of well we're not quite sure so i asked police scotland whether this had their support whether there would be any advice given to these officers or disciplinary action or or what well, here was the uh, here's the response. This is from Chief Constable Kenny Macdonald. He says, like many people in Scotland, indeed across the world, I'm shocked and distressed about the dreadful death of George Floyd and the subsequent events in the United States. Racism is, in all its forms is disgraceful and unacceptable. Those events do not reflect our style of policing in Scotland, and we continue to value the strong bond of trust with all our citizens and communities. <clears throat> More on that later. We uh, are aware of the Take the Knee, a global initiative which takes a stand against racism. So that's the endorsement. He continues, officers can take part if doing so is both operationally appropriate and in keeping with Police Scotland's core values and high levels of professionalism. So senior officers in Police Scotland are now endorsing the Take the Knee campaign. Um, and we'll look at in, in more in more detail shortly about what that actually involves. It did prompt me to go and look at what are Police Scotland's core values. And uh, they're helpfully stated on their website. Our purpose, focus and values. Our purpose is to improve the safety and well-being of people, places and communities in Scotland. Note, it's not to uphold the law. It's not to provide justice. It's safety and well-being. Um, re well-being, remember, they cannot define uh, it, broadly speaking, uh, may mean something like happiness, uh, but we're not absolutely sure. Um, back in the days of name person, when it was written into legislation, they still couldn't define it. Uh, Nick Marks um, of the uh, New, Found New Economics Foundation, he came up with this the, the definition, well-being is not a beach you can go and lie on. It's a sort of dynamic dance and there's movement in, all of, in that all the time. And it's the functionality of that movement, which is true well-being. That's still the best definition we have, and yet that's Police Scotland's purpose. Their focus is to keep people safe, not to uphold the law, to keep people safe. Remember the, the, the quote about if you give up uh, liberty for safety, you'll get neither. Police Scotland are only about keeping people safe. And then they talk about integrity, fairness and respect. More on that in extra time. They're not the only people in Scotland taking the knee, however. Here we've got Leslie Evans the head of the Scottish Civil Service, tweeting out in our own Twitter account, I take the knee in solidarity and support of Black Lives Matter. And there she is on her Edinburgh doorstep. Now, this is the woman who was in, intimately involved in the prosecution of Alex Salmond, which looks ever more like a political show trial, and who um, refused to answer straightforward questions uh, from Robert Green about his prosecution persecution at the hands of the Scottish state. Um, it wasn't that she she gave answers we didn't like. She just said, I've been told not to speak to you. She couldn't answer the questions and just went to went into hiding. That's the quality of the person running the Scottish civil service. Now she's out kneeling. But again, what's she kneeling to? What's she given submission to? We don't really know. Um, but it's OK, because in Scotland, we've still been told uh, it's all about COVID. COVID's a big threat, don't, don't go out, stay two metres apart, wear a face covering, wear a, we're not going to be masked, uh, wear a face covering in enclosed spaces, um, wash your hands regularly, stay at home if you have symptoms, so COVID's the big threat. Uh, uh, David, of course, if you're, if you're hoping to stoke up uh, difficulties on the streets, if you're hoping to, hoping to stoke up conflict amongst people, uh, the fact that they're required to wear a mask uh, is, is quite useful to that purpose. It's, it's remarkably convenient. And of course, at the same time as Police Scotland and the Scottish Government are putting out all of this, um, stay away from everybody else, be afraid of everybody because COVID's going to get you. Um, they are at the same time allowing, indeed encouraging, huge gatherings of people in public to protest BLM issues. Um, and uh, we've got a little bit of video here where a member of the public in Scotland went up to police, uh, some, of, some of these Scottish police officers and asked them about this uh, contradiction. 
Under full enforcement, yeah. Right. Am I right? Has it been cancelled, yes or no? Restrictions have been eased. So am I right to believe that the restrictions in place are still that you're not allowed more than eight people gathering in a public place, is that correct? So is that correct? Yes or no? Obviously Nicola Sturgeon's office say that this is okay to go ahead. Yeah, so Nicola Sturgeon has said this yeah. is okay to go ahead, yeah. Nicola Sturgeon's office, Nicola Sturgeon's office said the huge gathering of people was okay to go ahead. The police officers on the ground are not enforcing the regulations because Nicola Sturgeon's office said that that particular group of people was okay. So I have a question for you, gentlemen. Does that mean that Nicola Sturgeon's office is now in operational control of Police Scotland? Does that mean Nicola Sturgeon's office is now writing the laws of Scotland daily to suit a political agenda? It has to be one of the two. Uh, very good questions. Uh, certainly looks like uh, whether it's conscious or not, that particular policeman is uh, certainly looking to Nicola Sturgeon to decide what his job is. Yeah, this is it. Not thinking for himself, not upholding the law. Politically led policing. Political led policing. And then we must ask the other question really about COVID-19. Is it that, you know, Nicola Sturgeon is, is very up on, we've got to be really careful to protect people from COVID-19, be alert. Uh, but COVID doesn't go to these sorts of demonstrations. COVID goes to pubs and it goes to restaurants, but it doesn't go to these sorts of demonstrations. It, it, it is an amazing virus, the way, the way it works this way. Yeah, it's okay in supermarkets. It's no trouble at all, but little corner shops, oh, deadly. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but David, in the meantime, uh, how is the BBC reporting this? It's been spectacular, Mike. Um, here we have a BBC tweet here. 27 police officers injured during largely peaceful anti-racism protests in London. There we go. Have you ever seen anything so ridiculous? Lawrence Fox thought it was ridiculous. Uh, he, he gave some other examples. Um, massacre avoided at Agincourt after largely peaceful negotiations on French battlefield. And small number of Irish people die after largely positive potato harvest. Yes, this is the sort of things that the BBC would have been reporting back then had they been in, in existence. It is a spectacular bending of the truth. And I thought, well, that's the BBC and what The Guardian will no doubt be the same. But no, it's spreading. If you now look at the Times, um, policewoman broke bones in horse fall. She was out for a wee ride. It was, I'm sure it was all very innocent. And they go on a police officer who came off her horse. He just came off her horse. There was nothing else involved, nothing to see here. During a Black Lives Matter rally, will be off work for four months after she suffered a collapsed lung, broken collarbone and shattered ribs. Now, they're not really highlighting the fact that the horse bolted because someone threw a bike, a bicycle at it in the middle of a riot. No, she just came off her horse. So the times are up to this as well. Uh, but the Times go on and they quote Christina Dick. So it's, it's always good to see what the head of the Metropolitan Police at these difficult times is saying about the rioting, um, defacing of monuments and uh, assaults on her officers that are happening all over the capital. So um, she says it's shocking and completely unacceptable and urged protesters to stay at home during the pandemic. She said, I'm deeply saddened and depressed that a minority of protesters became violent towards officers in central London. This led to 14 officers being injured, in addition to 13 hurt in earlier protests this week. The number of assaults is shocking, completely unacceptable. I know many who are seeking to make their voices heard. So she feels she feels with the, the protesters here. She's on the side of the protesters. I feel I know many who are seeking to make their voices heard will be as appalled as I am by those scenes. There's no place for violence in our city. I would urge protesters to please find another way to make your views heard, which does not involve coming out onto the streets of London, risking yourself, your families and officers as we continue to face this deadly virus. So it's all about COVID or maybe she's talking about another virus. Maybe the deadly virus is something else entirely, something that's been spread by the media, for example, um, by the media and by local authorities, because 
they're getting involved as well. Here we see Bristol City Council are tweeting out, take the knee. What are they kneeling about? They don't say what they're bowing down before, really. Um, but the, the City Council regards it's, it's not about schools and, and keeping the roads uh, in good order and, and, and making sure the bins are emptied. No, they're about political messaging in a nice shade of black, red, and white, by the way, we've seen those colors before, uh, to get people at one another's throats and to support Black Lives Matter. And what's Black Lives Matter? It's not quite what you might think. Uh, here's a quote from their website. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. We foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all the world are heterosexual unless she, he, or they disclose otherwise. So this is extreme leftism. This is destroy the family, first rule of communism, destroy the family. It's bringing in queer theory. It's, it's, it's bringing in collectivism and it's taking out the family unit because the family unit is genuine diversity. It's not about diversity, it's about uniformity. And they're going to achieve that by first and foremost, destroying the family. Um, and what, this is one of the things that, that has struck me about this, this whole uh, exercise since, uh, since the killing of, of Floyd. The, the, uh, people are often with the best intentions uh, attempting to, to make a statement about their views on the killing of that man, but also on the broader issue uh, of, of race and so on. They don't really uh, grasp what it is that is actually going on here. We've got protests which are being organized by an organization which actually doesn't seem to be about race or the issues of race. It's about globalist policy. Again, the same types of globalist policy that we're seeing being pushed through our, our schools. David, uh, and, and you have asked on a number of occasion, occasions now, what are people bending the knee to? And it seems that, that uh, whether it be clapping for the NHS or bending the knee or whatever the gesture is, um, PR companies and vested interests are pushing forward ritualistic behavior yeah. in people, um, which has a psychological effect, but people don't really understand what it is that the ritual is about. Yeah, I, I think they're looking for the new religion and they're not quite finding it, but they're trying on various things till they assemble something that maybe fits the bill. Um, it's uh, it's not, it, it's something that, uh, that, that is appearing because of a void. There's a void of faith in the society and they're trying to fill it and they're trying to fill it in a way that they can control and manipulate people. Um, and this, this next gentleman um, we're about to see here, uh, we've got a short clip. We've got a longer clip to play in, in extra time. Uh, his name is uh, David J. Harris. Um, he's an um, American commentator and um, a, a, a supporter of what you would call traditional values, Christian family man, likes Donald Trump, wants to drain the swamp. Um, and this is how he sees what the kneeling is uh, all about. Friends, I am seeing something that is completely disturbing to me. And when I say to me, I mean as an American first, then I mean as a member of the black community. I'm seeing people, white people, that are getting down on their knees and asking for forgiveness for nothing that they ever did wrong. So that we'll have uh, more on more from that gentleman in the extra time. He's highlighting the fact that um, it's a, a manifestation of narcissism, narcissism and emptiness in the in the far left view of the world that they only get satisfaction from seeing someone kneeling before them. 
that doesn't view one another as brothers, that doesn't view one another as in any way equal, and that the people insisting on this kneeling are the racists. I think he makes a good point. Uh, absolutely. Well, look, let's uh, let's move on to this. And this is The Atlantic. And the headline is from a day or two ago. The Atlantic is the Trump regime is beginning to topple. And the sub headline is the best way to grasp the magnitude of what we're seeing is to look uh, for precedents abroad. Uh, so this is uh, uh, an article by uh, Franklin Four, uh, And he talks about Gene Sharp. He says Gene Sharp distilled what he learned into a 93 page handbook from dictatorship to democracy, a how to guide for toppling, autoc toppling autocracy. And he says over the course of his presidency, Donald, presidency, Donald Trump has indulged his authoritarian instincts. And now he's meeting the common fate of autocrats whose people turn against them. What the United States is witnessing is less like the chaos of 1968, which further divided a nation, and more like the nonviolent movements that earned broad societal support in places such as Serbia, Ukraine, and Tunisia, and swept away the dictatorial likes of Milosevic, uh, Yanukovych, and Ben Ali. And he, he goes through a, a description of uh, Sharp's color revolution methods in this article, uh, and he says that. Uh, uh, talks about the Maidan coup in Ukraine. He says that when the country's president backed away from his plans to join the European Union, a crowd amassed in Kiev's central square, the Maidan, uh, the throngs initially had no avowed intention of, or realistic hope of overthrowing, overthrowing the kleptocratic president, uh, but instead of letting the demonstra demonstrators shout themselves hoarse in the thick of sub-freezing winter, Yanukovych set about violently, violently confronting them, and he goes on to describe uh, the, the typical explanation of, or, de or description of the, of the Maidan uh, revolution. Uh, and he says that it's astonishing how events in the US, despite all the obvious imperfections of the analogy, have traced the early phases of, of this history. Uh, this is an observable, sorry, this is observable in the images of the crowds on successive nights as Trump's violent suppression of the protests in Lafayette Square was only caused, has only caused the ranks to swell. Uh, so he's basically suggesting and calling for more of the same and suggesting that uh, what is at work uh, in the United States uh, will ultimately end in Trump's overthrow. Um, so uh, the Atlantic at the work once again there, David, but uh, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I find that really quite bizarre to suggest that what's happening in America is not stoking racial differences and animosities as in 1968 is bizarre. It's absolutely, well, it's, it's contrary to reality. It's a powder keg just now over race. And um, this, is the, this is the Atlantic using language not to describe reality, but to create reality. This is, yes. this is wizardry. This is witchcraft. This is not journalism. I think I can't add any more to that. Well, there's a, there's a very interesting uh, debate to be had on that particular subject, I think. Uh, absolutely. Uh, now, if you like what the UK Column does and you would like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. Uh, and there are uh, options to help us out there. And that would be much appreciated if you could. Now, uh, David Noakes, uh, who we've been mentioning on this program quite a bit over the last period of time, uh, has uh, uh, now had assets taken as a result of alleged proceeds of crime. Um, and uh, of course, this was action taken by the MHRA, the Medical and Health Regulation, Regulatory Agency, uh, against him for his uh, pr production of GCMAF as a, a, uh, med, med, sorry, a medicine for uh, uh, cancer and other things. Uh, this is really what the MHRA was claiming. He said that they said that Noakes made over 13 million pounds from the sale of GC Math between 2011 and 2015. Uh, they also claimed that uh, they seized at the, at the end of the thing, they seized uh, more than 10,000 vials of GC Math, which Noakes could have sold for 5.5 million pounds. And so as a result of the final court hearing last week, uh, 1.349 million pounds confiscation order uh, which means that identified assets uh, will be realized, as they say, and uh, paid to the Home Office for distribution under the proceeds 
of Crime Act 2002 incentivization scheme. So I just thought it would be worthwhile comparing uh, what David Noakes is alleged to have done uh, with GlaxoSmithKline because uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, seems to have uh, plenty of representation on the MH MHRA board. Uh, so let's have a look. Uh, uh, David Noakes, sales from GCMAF, apparently 13 million pounds. Uh, if we just take one of GSK's uh, medicines, Paxil, uh, they uh, sold $11.7 billion worth of Paxil. Uh, David Noakes killed or injured no people with GCMAF, uh, whereas GSK injured and killed, well, thousands of people, uh, not so many deaths, mostly injuries uh, with Paxil. Uh, David Noakes had no pounds paid out in civil claims as a result of GCMAF usage, uh, but uh, GSK had to pay out $3 billion in civil claims over Paxil, and that's just one of their medications. Um, so uh, David Noakes, uh, apparently, as we know, still in prison in uh, Exeter, uh, awaiting extradition to France, uh, for where more charges are going to be brought, uh, apparently on the same uh, topic so double jeopardy at work there if anybody wants to write to david uh, and offer a little bit of support uh, then his prison number is a7081dy and he's at hmp exeter 30 new north road and that's in exeter ex44 ex um, and uh, well david i don't know what, whether you want to comment on this but but uh, you know I find the, the MHRA's position on what they've done to David Noakes absolutely disgraceful and untenable, really. It's completely untenable. But this is the thing, it's all about is what, is, what is fascism or crony capitalism. I, I, was, I was seeing a, a video by um, Dominic Frisby saying crony capitalism will not be tolerated, and he was listing some examples. There's another example, because the link between the power and the state and big business is such that well, competition will not be uh, not be permitted. Different ideas will not be permitted. How many people will die because of the ideas that were never brought to market? We'll never know. In Glasgow in the 1970s, if you wanted to set up an ice cream van business, a man with a baseball bat would bar your entry to the marketplace. Now, in 2000. 20, if you want to actually do something to help people with cancer, it's a similar situation. It's just more refined. There's a court involved. The effect's the same. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Good news, everyone. Uh, there is mental health support coming for stu uh, pupils and teachers at schools. Uh, because uh, this is uh, new online resources designed by health and education experts provided to schools and colleges to boost mental health support for staff and pupils, encouraging them to talk more confidently about the anxieties and concerns they feel as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Videos, webinars, teaching materials produced in partnership with charities will be made available to schools and colleges, helping to foster conversations about mental health and reassure many young people who are worried about the impact uh, of the viruses on their lives. The Department of Education has announced grant, grants worth more than £750,000 for the Diana Award, the Anti-Bullying Alliance and the Anne Frank Trust, uh, and a new £95,000 project in partnership with Education Support Partnership uh, is going to focus on teachers and leaders' mental health. Uh, and this uh, adds to the support the government has already put in place to help families and children during the pandemic, uh, with more than £9 million already being invested in mental health charities. Uh, David, this looks to me like uh, government bungs to the charities, uh, but it's a great business model because what you do is you send children back to school where they're required to social distance, uh, to not have no human contact with their friends or their teachers. You cause the mental problems that may result uh, from that. And then you fund the charities to come along, uh, ride on their white horses and solve the problems for the kids. This is, this is a fantastic business model. It, it's quite something. Uh, it's uh, called Machiavellian, I think is the word. And yeah, you, you create the problem and you profit from the problem. And the, the purchase of the charities, we've seen this in Scotland a lot, the purchase of the loyalty of the charities via state funding is close to absolute. 
It makes them, for all practical purposes, an extension of the state, and it provides um, the, the 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 bolstering to the state narrative. Because whenever challenged, the state will say, well, look at all these charities. The charities, they must be good because the charities, they all support us. We must be right. We must be good. And voices which are um, raised in objection to harmful and dangerous laws are silenced by this. They're silenced by the bottom paid for charities and instead of being listened to. Again, a little bit more on, on that particular subject, hopefully in a couple of minutes. Uh, OK, uh, and just briefly on the quarantine, then, of course, it begins today. Anybody coming into the UK is going to be required to self-isolate for 14 days. Uh, and, uh, well, you have to give your mobile phone number or some kind of contact details to the uh, border officials when you come in to the country. And then you're likely you're possibly going to face fines of up to a thousand pounds if you break the rules. Uh, Boris Johnson, in the meantime, is trying to uh, organise an air bridge, as he's describing it, uh, to allow holidaymakers to travel to the EU without having to go through quarantine from mid-July. Uh, but uh, as usual, the rules aren't entirely clear. Uh, we'll come on to that a little bit more in a second. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the, the uh, uh, BA, Ryanair, EasyJet, now all getting together uh, in an effort to bring some legal action against the government, against this quarantine. Uh, them and plus 500 or so travel and hospitality businesses uh, br bringing some legal action. The three airlines have uh, sent a pre-action letter to the government uh, challenging the new rules uh, and they've set up a, uh, a group called Quash Quarantine uh, which uh, they hope to uh, uh, operate through to bring this legal action. Uh, Michael O'Leary from Ryanair said to the BBC, you could be in Sainsbury's, you could be on the beach, uh, you could be on the golf course in the unlikely event that the Home Office calls you. Uh, all they will have is a mobile number. So he's complaining that uh, people really don't know whether, where you are if they make a phone call to you. They can't actually prove where you are. You could be anywhere. And he's concerned that really the quarantine rules are such nonsense that it's going to put people off travelling. But don't worry. Uh, some people thought, great idea. If we're, if we're leaving the country, we'll come back through Ireland because, of course, there's the common travel area. There's no border. You can come back through Ireland uh, and get back into the UK that way. Well, no, uh, the government has decided you're not allowed to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, if you attempt to uh, come back from your holiday uh, through Ireland, you will have to prove that you were in Ireland for 14 days before you enter England or the UK, the, the, the British mainland. Uh, otherwise, uh, you'll be in big trouble. So uh, uh, 14 days is what you're required to do uh, if you happen to be traveling, trying to travel back through Ireland in order to avoid the 14-day quarantine. Uh, they're going to get you either way. Right, and they're quarantined because they've come from a... A foreign country, yes. A foreign country. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, I was just thinking if they came from a foreign country into a protest in Scotland, it wouldn't matter, would it? They no, could no, fly no. straight in they, to Edinburgh or Glasgow and go straight to the protest approved by uh, Nippy and it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, yeah, great. Now, look, David, guess what? Uh, your friend, uh, uh, Professor John Edmonds, who was on the programme last week, has been speaking out today. Uh, he's trying to justify the fact that uh, lots of people have died in the UK from COVID-19. Uh, by saying, I wish we'd gone into lockdown earlier. Uh, that has caused a lot of lives. Uh, so apparently the fact that we didn't go into lockdown on, down on time is what's caused the lives, uh, caused the, the, the high cost in lives. Well, actually, I would uh, argue with that uh, and I would suggest he needs to uh, provide some justification for the number of people that have died as a result of the lockdown policy. Uh, this is the graph that we've been showing over the last few weeks. Uh, the graphic that we've been showing over the last few weeks and really what we're saying is that the majority of excess mortality uh, has been as a result of the lockdown. Now uh, people that I know in the health service are saying to me that this week, uh, this past week is the first week pretty much since the lockdown began and maybe a little before that, that they have had people coming to their doctor surgeries uh, with the normal things that they know uh, were, were coming to them for in the past before this COVID-19 thing happened because a large number of these uh, excess mortality has been a result of the fact that people have not been receiving the normal medical treatment that they normally expect to get 
Uh, they've been dying from heart attacks and strokes in their homes because they haven't been able to go to the hospitals and they haven't been able to go to their doctors. Uh, so as I say, uh, people starting to, to phone the doctor surgeries with the, with the normal kinds of things now, yeah. Brian, uh, but still I don't think the health service is providing a service uh, for the majority of people that have non-COVID related uh, issues. Well, uh, I can see evidence of that locally. Doctor's surgery, you can't go to the surgery unless you wear a face mask. So they've still got restrictions in. But let's just come on to this one. And many thanks for the viewer who flagged this one up. It's the Daily Mail reporting that actor Tony Robinson has been slamming the government over the number of elderly people that have died in care homes. And um, it's interesting, isn't it? It takes another celebrity to um, identify the problem. The government seems to be incapable, or maybe they're doing something different. But a striking article with a lot of information, and let's try and do this pretty uh, quickly. Um, so basically, he said that care homes have been used as ghettos to get people out of hospitals. So we have had a mini epidemic. Thousands of elderly people have died who shouldn't have died. And that is kind of manslaughter, really. Mm. Uh, he said this, it happened due to inactivity when the facts were on every government minister's desk. We've just got to make sure this doesn't happen again. The lobby still has to be there. So the facts were on the minister's desks. It's a kind of manslaughter. I think this is a bit of understatement, but at least he's stating it, whereas we haven't got anybody in government. But he's being backed up by this man, William Lang, who's of a, a very big healthcare consultancy, quoted in the paper. He said at the peak of the crisis, there were widespread reports of normal medical support simply being removed from care homes, which is what you're talking about, Mike. Ambulances would turn up to take emergencies to hospital. Um, would not. Sorry, would not turn up to, uh, to take emergencies to hospital since capacities uh, capacity had to be kept clear for COVID cases. In-person GP house calls were replaced with occasional telephone calls in the absence of any expectation of active medical support. Care home residents were encouraged to consider what instructions they should give in the case of serious illness from whatever cause, with many opting for do not resuscitate. So that's pretty cruel and vicious. Care homes have been asked by NHS Trust to accept discharges without knowing the coronavirus status of the patient. So this man's spelling out very clearly there was a policy to uh, get elderly residents to put DNR down and also they weren't getting any care. So if we come back, the statistics they're talking about were over 25,000 hospital patients moved to care homes between March the 17th and the middle of April. And the study said that by the end of June, the COVID death toll they believe could approach 59,000 now, of which 34,000, 57% will have been care home residents. So we're talking about 30,000 elderly people dying unnecessarily, not being debated by the national press and media. One article, nothing in parliament, no debate. And since the government knew what they were doing, this has to be a deliberate policy to kill off tens of thousands of elderly people. Um, David, I'm going to say the government knew absolutely what they were doing with this policy. They carried it out. They made sure the doors of those care and residential homes were closed. They denied the medical assistance and they simply stood back and watched as the dead bodies came out. This is manslaughter. It's not a kind of manslaughter. It's manslaughter. The do not resuscitate forms. Um... They weren't just encouraged to fill these on. These were these were being filled out wholesale. There was uh, one um, care home in Glasgow which had something like ninety residents, and every single one had a DNR form. Everyone. They didn't all sign up for that. This was policy, and the lack of and I mean pulling pulling medical care from care homes. That alone is bound to res result in, in more rapid death. Mm. It's bound to, it's inevitable. And it is a little bit creepy coming after all of the dark threats against the elderly because of their political views. They vote the wrong way. Yeah. 
Indeed. Well, yeah, <laughs> brings us into the realms of Cambridge Analytica, I think, which uh, we will certainly be covering. Uh, OK, so let's uh, let's have a look at this, David. Now, you mentioned this to me at the end of last week, but uh, coronavirus in Scotland, stare down shoppers who don't wear face masks, says Minister. This is in The Times. Uh, and this is uh, Mike Russell, the Scottish Constitution Secretary, uh, who's basically saying that uh, people should stare down anybody who goes shopping without a mask on. Uh, well, I just wanted to remind everybody, of course, uh, that uh, the SPI-B, the Sage Behavioural Subcommittee, uh, what they said in their various reports, uh, saying a substantial number of people still do not feel sufficiently personally threatened. The perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased amongst those who are complacent using hard-hitting emotional messaging. And they also went on to say uh, that... Uh, Social disapproval from one's community can play an important role in preventing antisocial behaviour or discouraging failure to enact pro-social behaviour. So, David, I'm going to suggest that that's exactly what Mike Russell is doing, uh, encouraging social dis disapproval. He has clearly read the SPI-B or has taken advice from SPI-B and has decided to implement it. It's one of the strange things about Scottish politics. The nationalists talk about Westminster bad and oh, it's London's fault and it's not us and it's those nasty English Tories. And still, remarkably, they adopt the policies. It's it full wholeheartedly. They do the same in defence, right? They're, they're backing the whole fusion doctrine. And here we have, I mean, Brian's talked often about the, the film and book, The Men Who Stayed at Goats. Now we've got the MSP, who stares at shoppers. I put it to you, Mike, that if Mike Russell stared at you, you would feel personally threatened. He's, he's, he's got that kind of aura about him. And here we have, they're putting in, in a really intense way, exactly what's coming out of the cabinet office, the Sedwell clique, the think tanks in London. It's, it's, and, and it's simply, um, a, di a distraction from the, for the Scottish people to put it through this filter of the SNP, which doesn't appear to do anything or mean anything, uh, in order to give it a you know a, a, a tartan fringe. Tartan, some tartan fringe. Uh, well, we're very <coughs> excuse me, very tight for time, but let's get this in at the end of the news because COVID. What's it all about? Where's it heading us for? Why all the violence and chaos now coming in? We're going to put it to our viewers and listeners that this is about the Great Reset. And uh, we don't have to look far because The Guardian are happy to be promoting Prince Charles on this uh, fascinating subject. He says we've got a golden opportunity to seize something good from this crisis. It's unprecedented shockwaves may well make people more receptive to big visions of change. So we're going to make them more receptive. We're going to use applied psychological um, techniques in order to make you think and behave the right way. Prince Charles thinks that's all good stuff. Um, but this is uh, what he's on about, which is the World Economic Forum. Please go to this website and read this material for yourself because they want a great reset to build a new social contract that honours the dignity of every human being. Well, I don't think it's going to be doing that. But the global health crisis, luckily, has laid bare the unsustainability of the old system in terms of social cohesion, the lack of equal opportunities, inclusiveness. Now, uh, sorry, nor can we turn our backs on the evils of racism and discrimination. Fascinating that's in there at the time of this trouble. We need to build into this new social contract our intergenerational responsibility to ensure we live up to the expectations of young people. And luckily, COVID-19 has accelerated our transition into the age of the fourth industrial revolution. So what an amazing coincidence that uh, this winter virus becomes a super virus and it just helps accelerate the transition into the fourth industrial revolution. But uh, relax because new technologies in the digital, biological and physical world are going to remain human centred and serve society as a whole providing everyone with fair access, whether you want it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Great Reset will require us to integrate all stakeholders of global society into a community of 
common interest purpose and action so lots of material on the website it's a great time for the reset digital entrepreneurs can get in new york is going to become a fairer city over after covid 19 um, by agenda 2030 policy the prince charles obviously put his uh, full penny worth in there's your friend ursula von der Leyen, mike who's uh, she's pushing it as well how the great COVID-19 reset can help firms into a sustainable future. So this virus is very attractive to a lot of people. This one caught my eye though, great reset. Uh, why LGBT inclusion is the secret to cities post-pandemic success. So if you want to solve economic crisis in Birmingham or London or Bristol or, or London, uh, you need to get more LGBTs in. I don't know how that works, but there we are. And of course, what do we need? We need money. So here's the statement from uh, the chief economist of the World Economic Forum. And uh, she says, well, coming into the crisis, we've got about 40% of low-income countries that are already in debt, distress, or at high risk of being in distress. And now we've, we've got the additional spending needs I mean, these are critical spending needs and they cannot be postponed. We've got to spend money. So she then divides things into two, two parts. One is that countries that are already in that distress with very high levels of debt that are not able to borrow reasonable terms on international markets. For these countries, the approach has to be to provide concessional financing and for the poorer countries, debt service relief. And of course, at the IMF, we're going to be doing both. Then there's a second bucket of countries where there's no debt crisis. We need to make sure they receive the right amount of liquidity that they need to prevent them from being pushed into a solvency problem. So they don't need the money, but we're going to make sure they can get the money. Yeah. You get the idea of what's going on here. And then she says she wants to be optimistic and she wants to say that the world will come together and we will come out of this eventually in a stronger, better form in terms of globalization. So for the World Economic Forum, COVID-19 is just fantastic because we can get in the money and the debt. And uh, but she's a little bit worried because actually some countries have turned in on themselves because they didn't get the help from the global system. So they've become more nationalistic. Uh, but if you want to know what the World Economic Forum is doing, it's full of change agents and the red dots show the spread of the change agents. And what sort of people have we got? Well, of course, we don't have to go far when we see the banking uh, system. So here's MasterCard. Uh, we've got a big input from the Chinese banking system. Uh, we've got BP because you need oil barons in there to help the future. And uh, we've also got Microsoft president so those are all good clean people uh, trust them the only thing to remember is that in the fourth industrial revolution it will only be stakeholders and david those stakeholders are going to be charities for example they're not going to be voters no it's uh that's a remarkable little uh examination of um the, the, the wef the idea that uh, the, the the quote unquote healthy economic countries like Britain and America, we don't have a debt problem. It's just a liquidity problem. I think we've had, we've heard that particular story uh, before. It's just a few years ago. It wasn't true then either. No. Well, I had to put this uh, little image up on screen. Firstly, it's advertising the book from the president of the world economic forum the fourth industrial revolution so if you want to see in detail what these people are up to you need to buy that book because he he does need a bit of help with the money uh, but this was the photo that took my uh, interest because here's uh, mr schwab himself with uh, prince charles uh, what were they talking about well no 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 the weak low iq infirm and elderly will not be part mm. well of course uh, we don't know what he was saying but i think they were basically saying that the weak the low iq the infirm the elderly the vulnerable will not be part of the fourth industrial revolution uh, and david uh, we're just going to end with this uh, this little meme that's been doing the rounds yes i i like this because i thought this this little meme spoke of a of, of a few of a few bigger truths here so we see the complete carnage that the lack of policing 
in London has caused. There's mayhem in the streets. There's bits of horses running around all over the place. And superimposed in it, we've, we've got a smiling Christina Dick looking benignly at the scene which she has created. And uh, beside her, the mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, who someone has somewhat unkindly suggested a, is in fact a bit of a donkey. Uh, I, I thought both of those things were uh, very interesting comments. And uh, we better just remind viewers and listeners that Crusader Dick, of course, heavily common purpose trained. So she was reframed very early on. And then we saw a meteoric rise through the police. Um, so if you want to know what a future leader is like, somebody who's prepared to lead outside authority, that is what common purpose trained their leaders to do. Crusader Dick is, is one of their senior leaders. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll leave it there. Mm. Thanks very much for joining us, David. Thank you to our viewers and listeners. And if you're not already a subscriber, please consider uh, subscribing to UK Column and or making a donation. We can only do what we do with your help and support. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.